Good evening, and um, I'd like to just remind you why we're here and what we're here to discuss so that we can focus on that. I know that Zimbabweans and the groups that come here are always very impassioned about topics, and we'd really like to try and keep this focused. Zimbabwe's leaders have been locked in a shaky power-sharing coalition <coughs> since opposition leader Shangarai was sworn in as prime minister in January 2009. This agreement followed a period of violence and turmoil after the 2008 elections, which Mugabe is widely believed to have stolen. Mugabe is now pressing for fresh, elec fresh elections in 2011, despite MDC leader Shangarai saying that they could not take place without reforms and constitutional review. Analysts fear that Zimbabwe could be marred by violence in a repeat of 2008 when Mugabe lost the popular vote but forced a win in a runoff election. With the military, police and state apparatus on his side, there is little chance that Mugabe would allow a free or fair election which would likely ensure his removal from power. Could there be a fair election or will violence and intimidation again escalate? And just to put it in more context, today activist Gwisai Munyaradzi and 45 other activists who were arrested over the weekend have been charged with treason for watching a video of the Egyptian uprisings. And Douglas Mwanzora, who is co-head of the Constitutional Parliamentary Committee, trying to move the country towards a new constitution, is still incarcerated with about 20 other MDC. And there are myriad more arrests and incarcerations at the moment. To debate the situation on the panel, we have on my left, Jeff Hill, who's a bureau chief in Joburg for the Washington Times and author of The Battle for Zimbabwe and What Happens After Mugabe. Next to him is Mr. George Shiri, who's a cultural theorist and editor of Soundings, a journal of politics and culture. Then it's Chofamba Sitoli, a Zimbabwean journalist and community organizer, and Miles Tendi, an academic and author of Making History in Mugabe, Zimbabwe, Politics, Intellectuals, and the Media. So to start, I'm going to ask each of the panelists just to give a few minutes analysis of what they see as the way ahead of what's happening. And then we want to make this as interactive as possible. So immediately after that, I'll come to the floor and you can have questions or have statements. So, um, Joe, I'll start with you. Sure thing. I think it's very important in Zimbabwe not to focus too much on the shorter term, but to look at the longer term. And I do believe that we've become so wrapped up in the figure and person of Mugabe that perhaps we're not seeing beyond into the rest of the country. Robert Mugabe was, what, 87 this, is this week? He's just turned 87. He is, by all accounts, not a particularly well man. There's a whole lot of things you can do at 87. A punishing 14, 15 hour day running a country is not one of them. And I do, and that's, I do believe that the time has come to look at how we're going to take Zimbabwe and rebuild it after the time of Mugabe, regardless of who is in power um, when Mugabe goes. I do not hold out good prospects for a free and fair election, because as Jerry said, I, I share Jerry's view, it's just my view and Jerry's view, that, that in a free and fair election, Mugabe would lose power, Zana PF would lose power, uh, for a whole number of reasons, which I won't go into, and certainly I think the reason you're here tonight is probably because you've read enough on Zimbabwe to know. The question I've been asked over the last three, four weeks, more than any other, is could a Tunisian, Egyptian, around the last few days, Libyan revolt take place in Zimbabwe? And the answer is no. It's not going to migrate. That kind of revolution is not going to migrate into sub-Saharan Africa. But there have been today people on the streets in Bulawayo, right? Police on the streets in Bulawayo, as Jerry said, activists who've been locked up. Situation is tense and nervous. Zana PF has started distributing T-shirts and sewing machines, which is a suggestion that elections are sooner rather than later. People also ask the Constitution. Will it be changed before the election or after the election? And I say it doesn't really matter because under the current constitution you can't torture people, beat people, and do all the things that have been ha happening in Zimbabwe for the last, it's not, it's not the past 30 years, for the past 50 years. So it doesn't, we shouldn't get too bogged down in that. What we should look at is this coming election and the election after that. 
and the process of getting Zimbabwe into a real working democracy either now or over the next five years and who the leaders are who are likely to play in that game. I believe that's where the focus should be if we want to do any good. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. And George. Hi. Um, <clears throat> well, I'm uh, trying to hoik my head around how to make something of a stab to this uh, peculiar, I say peculiar deliberately, conversation. Partly because uh, we don't yet know what all the political institutions or parties in Zimbabwe will tell us as what they will stand for should there be an election this year. And I say that not just being clever, but because I think part of the problem about our making sense of Zimbabwe, not just because what you want to see or what you'd like, is that most of us, most of us who comment on Zimbabwe, have become part of the story. And becoming part of the story, we fail to analyze or make sense of, indeed, share with what exactly is going on in Zimbabwe. So I, I make those cautionary remarks really with serious concern. So we don't yet know what are the ZANU PF or the MDCT or M or N, whatever surname they have, is going to stand for in the next uh, forthcoming elections. What we do know is that the GPA, the Global Partner Agreement, is coming to an end. What we do know is that the GPA has had, had uh, an agenda coming out of what sets out the rather like the coalition government here it does have its own agenda and one you can assume that when they do face the electorate all those political institutions will ask tell us what was successful what failed who played what who did what and so on and we can predict already if you look at it that way what some of the lines of contestation are likely to be and i argue whether one agrees it or not the combined effect of the European Union directives and ZEDRA has an effect, including the activities of Australia and New Zealand and Canada, has an effect that has understood in Zimbabwe as sanctions. And you're going to have an argument in that election about whether or not they were effective, who, are, who, 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 who was affected by, by them and who wasn't. The second thing I would like to draw attention to, if you look at the 13 articles that make up the, the, the Global Partition Agreement, 10 of them, 10 out of the 13, were literally lifted out of the 208 ZANU-PF manifesto. And it tells you a great deal then on what lines that, 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 that argument is going to take place. So for example, um, ZANU-PF might say, we were successful in making sure A, B, C, D, E was in place. And MDCT, I would imagine, would say also, we were successful in doing ABCD, or certain kind of moves were, were hindered by ZANU-PF. What, what I find very difficult to conceptualize is how one can produce an electoral uh, slogan that says, vote for me because ZANU-PF did not appoint a governor, or vote for me because so-and-so, God knows what. Yes? So in a way, in a way this, this stage for the election, the real questions that Zimbabweans are going to be asked to vote for one party or another or many is largely going to be dependent by what happened to the GPA, what is in their manifesto, and indeed how you read Zimbabwe as part and parcel of SADAC. Now, the second comment I want to make is, is apart from, and I can come back to those, is to do with... Uh, some of the myths, and, and really, really I really want to have a go at the world of journalism, some of the myths that uh, have dominated our thinking about, about Zimbabwe or elsewhere. It was always a mistake. It was always a mistake to single out the removal of Robin Mugabe as an end in itself. It, it just was bound to die from day one. Why I say so is because the sites of power in Zimbabwe are not concentrated in one person or anywhere else for that matter. Okay. There are a number of ways in which one can articulate local, interregional, national, so local, um, uh, provincial, national, regional issues in, 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 in the political landscape of not just Zimbabwe or the region. And what is so sad was that in the last 10 years, we have had very little of what all these political institutions actually stand for, other than using the name Robert Mugabe to frighten one's kids to go to bed. Um, 
the third concern I have, and this has to do with where I began. I perfectly understand and sometimes sympathize the anger that some people who were thrown out of the country legally or legally by Robert Mugabe and others, whether they were journalists and so on, would feel about Zimbabwe. But they have become, sadly, the story in itself. As if, if you were in Jombe, you would decide to vote whether or not me, a journalist who lives in New York, comes back to Zimbabwe. You know, it, it, we really do need to descend ourselves in our practice as being distinctively different from the wishes and intentions of what goes on in the country. Now, I'd like to finish with the question about the land <coughs> question. I became a bit notorious and unpopular for arguing very much in 2008 and nowhere that I actually you couldn't talk about Islam politics without also making sense of how the land issue got to where it is or where it was or how it might be resolved. This is not to justify people being beaten up or being thrown out of their homes, whatever might happen. You cannot address that question. You cannot get into political ascendancy into that place without somehow coming up with a convincing narrative that counts as majority. Right? And for the last 10 years, we've been told that the land reform program was a nightmare, that it was a failure, it went to the cronies of Florence, so and so on. And lo and behold, in the last two months, a credible research conducted through the Institute of Development Studies of the of Sussex, funded by the IDS and a number of others, has come up in the opposite, disrupting all those myths which I argue journalists could have made sense of had they bothered to do the work. So my argument is not saying Robert Mugabe is right, Morgan Changra is wrong. I mean, there's nothing wrong with arguing that if that's what you want to do. The argument I want to make as of t for tonight is in three forms. One, we don't know yet what the elections are going to be about. But should we do want to do that, we can draw from those kinds of things that matter in as far as the practical business of getting by is concerned. Let me just finish with the commentary about people being arrested in the last two or three weeks. Um, uh, and there are competing narratives about that. The competing narratives are these. There's one version that says there are a number of people watching what's going on in Tunisia and Egypt and so on, decided maybe we could have a local event, uh, a local version of Zimbab on the Zimbabwean story. And quite rightly, or quite wrongly, a repressive apparatus, a strong arm of the state, quelled it down. And Grisai has found himself in difficulty in that one. This is not the first time Grisai has found himself in confrontation with the police. I'm not suggesting that is a correct thing to do do need to understand is that it happens, not to build a polemic out of it. That would be my argument against the way in which it comes about. And secondly, I couldn't give a damn whether Robert Mugabe was 21 or 27 or 58 or 115. That has nothing to do with the practical issues that face up Zimbabweans today, be they it be the ecological, be they be about public services, be they be about the, the where we go from here now with the land question, be they to do with the national assets, be they to do with Zimbabwe's relationship with the rest of its neighbors, or indeed to try and make sense of the two political tendencies that dominate Zimbabwean politics. On one hand, those political cultures and institutions that grew out of the national liberation movement, on another, a more neoliberal, workerist, metropolitan-based discourse. They are different. And I think it is important to articulate and explain to people what those differences are and why they matter before and after people enter into the ballot box. <coughs> so those are just a sort of like the testers, if you like, that I might be prepared to share with you as we go along. Thank you. Thank you, George. Um, whether or not there's going to be an election this year, in my view, depends on the dynamics within ZANU-PF. Um, there's no consensus within you know, uh, the party that really is in the driving seat you know, in Zimbabwe on whether to go for elections this year or not. Um, there are clearly you know, arguments in favor of stability, largely to do with economic stabilization and economic recovery. And this argument is gaining currency, not least because of the uh, re-engagement uh, that has begun to happen um, with the international community on the business front. In, um, I think February was a frenetic month in terms of our business engagements with the international community. Um, the Chinese foreign minister was in Harare uh, to discuss a $10 billion you know, investment deal in uh, agriculture and mining. Um, a German delegation was in town with the uh, Commerce, Bank, uh, Commerce Bank of uh, Germany 
uh, dangling a 500 million euro you know, loan facility, uh, again for uh, Zimbabwean businesses in rehabilitation of infrastructure and the like. And um, a delegation from uh, the London Stock Exchange was also in town, again discussing you know, business re-engagement. And um, the vice president uh, from the Sun PF side, Joyce Mujuru, is clearly, you know, has come out, you know, clearly in favour of, uh, of 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 this, you know, business-centric approach, you know, to uh, to the transitional government, and uh, whether or not uh, her side of the argument and those who sympathise with her carry the day, as I said, really depends on the uh, the, the, the the dynamics within Sun PF, and um, I'm sure perhaps maybe Miles could have more to say, you know, about. The, the other side, you know, uh, or the other faction, the factions within Zanu PF, and what their take on uh, going for election this year might be. But um, I would say that, you know, from where I stand, um, I would tend to uh, endorse the, the the idea that there is currency, you know, in uh, the view that elections could be deferred in favour of the economic stabilisation <laughs> argument. Not least because it also comes with a re-engagement with the international community. Um, I think um, uh, Professor Stephen Chan has written uh, 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 recently about the um, changing uh, 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 mood or attitudes uh, within the EU itself and, uh, concerning re-engagement with Zimbabwe. In fact, uh, the German ambassador in Harare was very explicit in um, addressing the, uh, the rancor within the EU over the extension of the sanctions, uh, explaining the compromise to drop 35 names as a result you know, of those differences in approach on how to engage you know, uh, uh, Zimbabwe. And all that has to do with uh, doing business with Zimbabwe once more, uh, including even tolerating uh, a ZANU-PF, albeit perhaps maybe reformed, to what extent nobody knows. I suppose it depends with uh, the value of the deals that could be inked you know, between Harare and you know, uh, 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 international business. Um, but if elections should uh, proceed this year, uh, I wanted to address the constitutional question that um, the FDC finds itself in a precarious situation because it matters little whether the um, constitutional review process proceeds and uh, delivers a new constitution or whether the elections are held on the basis of the current constitution. Um, I, I, I share the view of uh, uh, some Zimbabwean civil society groups who accuse the MDC of having ditched the democratic you know, uh, uh, movement widely as civil society along with the MDC you know, see themselves as, um, that they um, decided to limit the constitution-making process to, to, to the politicians in parliament. So it uh, elbowed out you know, uh, popular or, or more broad-based participation by labor, by uh, women, students, and other groups you know, outside of uh, the inclusive government, the inclusive arrangement between ZANU PF and the MDCs, and what has happened, you know, uh, was uh, predictable, really, because um, uh, uh, ZANU PF had, on account of its reliance on, on the state apparatus, more mobilizational capacity in the outreach process, and so it so happens that um, more than 80 percent of those views are really, you know, ZANU PF views. So the MDC is caught up in a, you know, in a dilemma there, whether to discard, you know, that constitution when earlier on it had rebuffed you know, civil society's attempts to get on board. Um, if they should go back to the Lancaster House Constitution, again, the old arguments about, whether the, um, about why the, uh, the, the current constitutional order is not adequate you know, to delivering a free and fair election come up. So um, the bottom line, in my view, uh, is that should elections go ahead, uh, I see ZANU PF really in the driving seat and MDC is playing catch up. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Father. Miles. <coughs> um, thank you. Um, I, I will start by going back a little bit. Um, I still see, after two years of the power sharing government in Zimbabwe, I still see no other solution to the crisis at the time outside of power sharing, despite my many criticisms um, of the model. Uh, why? Because at the time, 2008, you could not have staged a military intervention to resolve the problem in Zimbabwe because of the sanctity of sovereignty in Africa. Um, sovereignty is an, in an inversion of colonialism. That's how it's considered. Moreover, with the lessons in Iraq and Afghanistan, nobody was going to do that. Um, sanctions, too, this was a situation of violence. 
the first port of call where, where violence persists, where a state has become a threat to its own citizens, is to protect the victimized citizens. Um, sanctions don't do that. So power sharing at the time was the only um, train in the station, and still is. But then starting from there, um, you have to see how, again, this is, I think it's essential to begin making a critique of the opposition, um, the MDC, in as far as how it engaged with power sharing. I, I, the last two weeks, I've been in Southern Africa and, and had the opportunity to interview Tawon Becky last week at length. And I'll, I'll share two things um, um, he shared with me about the power sharing negotiations. Mm -hmm. Number one, Tawon Becky wanted Robert Mugabe to be a ceremonial president. Mugabe would have had no power <laughs> in, 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 in the current setup. Um, who shot down um, Becky's proposal for Mugabe to be ceremonial president? Um, the other faction of the MDC, because they did not want Trangirai to become um, president, um, um, executive president, or executive prime minister, I should say. Right. And then the second thing um, he also shared with me, um, um, when ZANU-PF came to the table to negotiate power sharing, ZANU-PF wanted five years straight. There was to be no two years um, so that the GPA w would end up in two years and then possibly be extended. Had that passed, we'd be talking about stabilization, the economic growth, engagement exactly. that um, Chofamba speaks of. Who shot that, that down? The MDC, once again. Right. So that messed up the whole dynamic. And I think the situation, others here speak of the MDC playing catch up. A lot of it has to do with the MDC's own um, strategic errors. Then the, the next thing I want to get into is the importance of the Zimbabwean military. Um, it was the Zimbabwean military that um, prevented Robert Mugabe from stepping down in 2008. Um, power sharing came about because of the military's intransigence. Two years into the power sharing arrangement, he would think then from a strategic point of view that the MDC would have made an effort to engage the Zimbabwean military. They're human beings, they're not animals. They can be spoken with. Um, a transition can be managed. What has the MDC done? Um, the deputy, not the deputy, the co-minister for home affairs, who sits in the National Security Council, um, Giles Mutekwa, um, that the MDC appointed, is a former um, Rhodesian soldier. Now, you do not appoint um, a former Rhodesian soldier um, to work with army generals who fought in the Zimbabwean Liberation War and who refused to accept um, the MDC's um, rise to power on the basis that the party was linked to Rhodesian elements. Right? That just antagonized the military. So there's a wider rift between the MDC and the military um, um, today. And then the next thing I want to get into again, with regards to strategic errors as well, um, the MDC's focus on appointments. Constantly, when, um, when I spoke to Mbeki, and when you speak to elements in Zimbabwe, um, in, in ZANU-PF and, <coughs> and, and the MDC, Consistently, the MDC has argued with ZANU-PF over appointments to the Reserve Bank, um, the Attorney General, provincial governors. In doing so, right, they've paid less attention um, to arguments over institutional reforms. Right, um, the military remains um, unreformed. Um, the media reforms have not been implemented. But if you speak to MDC officials today, they will tell you the Reserve Bank governor was appointed illegally. Um, the provincial governor was appointed by Mugabe unilaterally. Um, this is what they focused on. Jobs for the boys instead of institutional reforms. So my line would be, because of the MDC's um, strategic errors, um, uh, we are where we are today. Um, and, and should the MDC find itself um, out of power this time, um, they only have themselves um, to blame. I think too much emphasis has gone into to, to what ZANU-PF has done. True, I'm not an apologist. ZANU-PF has waged violence. It has manipulated the, um, the, the state in various ways. Um, and, and I always tell people that um, ZANU-PF is a sophisticated party. <coughs> But I, I, the, more, the more I observe, the more I, I, I talk to, to people closely engaged with the power sharing process in Zimbabwe, I begin to wonder whether ZANU-PF is sophisticated at all, um, <laughs> or it's the fact that they just simply face a mediocre opposition. I think there's so much mediocrity in the opposition, in civil society, 
and again in line what George had to say in the way that international media and media in Zimbabwe um, has assessed the Zimbabwe problem. I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, I'm going to open it up to the floor now and I'm going to ask you to please give your name and if you represent an organization, a media, uh, and you feel it's valid, please tell us who that is. Just before we do that, I just want to remind you of something in this discussion. I run the radio station that broadcasts on to in via shortwave into Zimbabwe. So we speak to Zimbabweans every day. Zimbabwean people, particularly in the rural areas, feel completely left out of the political process. They feel completely left out of the election process. Come an election, they are asked always to vote wisely, go to the polls, show how brave they are, it doesn't matter how badly they get beaten. And they did that in 2000, and 2002, and 2005, and 2008, and they won in 2008, and they got beaten more. And now they are terrified, truly terrified, of another election. And a guy I spoke to just a couple of days ago said to me, I wish these politicians could have an election all by themselves and on their own and leave us out of it. And that is the sense on the ground. So as we intellectualize this and discuss this, I would like you to hold the long-suffering Zimbabwean people in your minds. Mm -hmm. Right, does anybody have a question or a statement they would like to start off with? Oh, come, come now. <laughs> Shy. These are not gurus. Question them. Yes, you sir. Oh, please wait for the microphone. Thanks. Um, my name is Duke Chipiero. Um, I'm just going to ask Miles a question. Um, you, you said um, the opposition is mediocre. Um, do, do you think, why, why do you think that? Why, why do you think, you think they were not really prepared or they are not? If, for instance, Mugabe was to, you know, for instance, pass away, you think Zimbabwe would not have someone to become a leader to kind of take the realm or, you know, which I guess the international media or international communities kind of looking for a change. You think if, for instance, Mugabe passes away, I know that's not the main point, but who do you think could really kind of step up to the plate? Um, I don't think it's, it's so much that um, you wouldn't be able to find somebody to, to run Zimbabwe um, should Mugabe die. I mean, there are many talented Zimbabweans um, in Zimbabwe and outside of the country. I think the problem has just been um, the way that the opposition has tackled Zanopiev uh, from a strategic point <coughs> of view. Um, I think examples are good. I'll give another example. These are the power sharing. This is from my interview with Tao Mbeki. These are the power sharing um, negotiations um, in 2008. They sit around um, all the various parties. They agree on a clause. Trangirai stands up and says, um, I need to go outside for a bit to consult my others in the MDC. Right. Um, the others at the table say, fine, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, we'll give you an hour. Come back in an hour. You tell us whether you agree with the clause. He goes out. They're based at the Rainbow Hotel in Harare. What does he do? He picks up the phone and calls the U.S. Embassy to ask for advice from the U.S. Ambassador. What does he not know? That the CIO, the Zimbabwe Intelligence, has tapped the phones. So they get a transcript of everything, right? And what do they do? See, as South African Zimbabwe Intelligence has a relationship with South African Intelligence. They pass on the transcript to South African Intelligence. South African Intelligence pass on the trans transcripts to, to Tabo Mbeki's lab, right? Mm. And he passes them on to other SADC leaders, right? So then you begin to, to Mugabe's narrative all along has been the MDC is a stooge of the West. What is that then? Right? And then people are surprised when SADC leaders don't take the side of, of the NBC. It's things like that. That's what I'm getting at, that mediocrity. It, it, it's, it's really pathetic that a leader would, would um, call up the U.S. Embassy um, for that sort of advice. Can, can I just say a little bit to that? A little, just a sure. Little, just a, you know, uh, it, it, it's a kind of side to that. I don't know whether anybody's been following what I've described as a sort of senior common room quarrel between Professor Mtambara and Professor Mude. Eh? I, I, I deliberately call it. And you wonder, you wonder what exactly is in the public interest in the argument between the two of them. Eh? And in some ways, that is what, what I hear from what Miles is talking about, is take your mind off the ball, the issues that matter, to something else. Okay? And, 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 it's, and it's not impossible to do that. But what has happened is a result of not 
focusing your mind on the ball. It has delayed, if you like, the coming into power of the MDC, whether you like them or not. Now, I, I, I read my comments in that sense. And, and, and perhaps it's too late even to, for the MDC to get its act together to focus on the national question. Because the bus has moved on. They do not have now, today, a convincing narrative that they could produce without coming into trouble with the very ineffectiveness that they've created for themselves. Not somebody else. It's not Zanvev that stands them in the way for not thinking properly. It's actually not taking advantages of the fault lines in Sang Zanvev that I'm, some of us are critical about. May I just point out something there? I'll come to you, sir, in a moment. Um, my many years reporting on Zimbabwe, and this is something we will never know. There are indications that the MDC have been infiltrated, and a lot of the problems are created by ZANU-PF infiltration. Although I accept the MDC have been dreadful in many areas. We must bear that in mind. And additionally, if you look at what has happened in the Arab world lately, when you have strong-arm dictators in power, they deliberately create a power vacuum, which is very difficult to fill when they go. It's deliberate policy. I just wanted to point that out. You said you had a uh, Yes, my name is Michael Sander. Uh, I don't represent anyone except myself. Um, bearing in mind that Lancaster House and when um, Zimbabwe gained its independence, the land issue was not actually addressed, really. Um, and also there's been, you've referred yourself to the rural areas and so on. Uh, I'd like to hear a bit more about this IDS research and what the report really shows, because it seems to be it's such a central issue in relation to all the yeah, certainly we do you know more about it um, and if we can keep it brief yeah. because well, the land issue becomes what? dominant yeah um, like um, um, basically what um, uh, if, you, if you refer to the, uh, the ideas research basically um, what Ian Schoons and his team sought to do was to challenge prevailing um, myths in the media about land reform um, in Zimbabwe you know that all the land went to the cronies um, nothing is going on on the farms, um, those sort of things. So they case studied Mashingo province um, uh, and the evidence that they found there, um, um, very um, 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 scientific factual evidence, is that in actual fact um, the land reform program is doing much better um, than, than, as, uh, than as, it, uh, as it's been portrayed in the media. And land did not necessarily go to, to friends of Robert Mugabe or people allied to, to, to Zano PF. That, that's, that's, that's the meat of, 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 of the book, essentially. Um, it sort of turns on its head um, prevailing myths about land reform um, in the country. Jeff, you have Can I, Yeah, I'd like just to comment on that. And I think we've got to be very careful on land. Um, in any country where you have had a wonderful education system, and I am no supporter of Robert Mugabe, but I have to salute him that when he came in, he took over Africa's highest literacy rate already. And he just mushroomed it, and he rolled out education everywhere. A former teacher, <coughs> if there's one thing Mugabe really got right, he gave us this brilliantly educated, literate, numerate country, which is why Zimbabweans do so well here in South Africa and everywhere else where they go. And when you educate people in the Philippines, Brazil, Thailand, Kenya, Zimbabwe, South Africa, the first thing they do when they get their education is they go to town. And there's this, still this notion, I have this argument with people in the ANC in South Africa, of the, the peasant farmer with Shakespeare in this hand and the donkey in that hand. No, he's at the door of Barclays trying to get a job. And land has become largely irrelevant in Zimbabwe because we've got such a young population. That young population is literate and numerate. And actually, no, they don't want to be on the land. Uh, they want to be in town. One of the things that caused the biggest problem for Zana PF was creating this educated class of young people and not providing the jobs and the changed situation in town um, to cope with the, ed the result of this education. So one's got to be very careful not to get too bogged down on the land. The quest in Zimbabwe, the riots in Zimbabwe in 97, not over land, over no jobs. In South Africa, we don't want to get into South Africa here, but in South Africa, there's only one political issue. And I'm in the townships and in Joburg and all the time. There's only one political issue. It's unemployment. It's not race. It's not me. It's unemployment. And in Zimbabwe, very much the same thing. So I'm going to be very, very careful not to get too caught up in that idea of land. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment on the uh, land issue there as well. Um, prefacing uh, comments made by Claire Short at uh, Miles' book launch at SOAS on Monday. 
um, she, she did repeat um, her understanding of uh, the, uh, the land question, you know, from Lancaster House, you know, uh, as represented in her now infamous letter uh, to uh, the Zimbabwean government that Britain had no colonial obligation to fund Zimbabwe's land reform uh, program. Um, uh, she said that in her understanding, um, land was a convenient political tool, you know, used by ZANU-PF, you know, to ramp up its uh, uh, po uh, waning popularity. Um, I am not disputing the, perhaps maybe, validity of that observation, but I think, um, again, it, um, it, I, I wanted, you know, just to, 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 uh, to, to caution on the uh, uh, pitfall of once again focusing on Robert Mugabe or ZANU PF and their you know power you know project at the expense of other dynamics within the country <coughs> among the population. In 97, in nine, uh, around 97, 98, we had land invasions, and these were by by peasants around Shoshe, Goromonzi, you know communal areas. And the response of the Mugabe government was to send in you know the police and beat people off those farms. That was their default response, and then. There was a, a, a concerted push by veterans who first came to the fore challenging their exclusion, you know, from uh, the fruits of independence by their erstwhile comrades mm -hmm. now in, you know, executive positions in government who were living it up and, um, you know, o o on the basis of having fought the liberation struggle and yet they were the, gun the guys who bore the guns and they were living in penury. And these guys first challenged, you know, uh, uh, their own, you know, colleagues within ZANU-PF, you know, and that's how they then got you know those pensions and they were brought in in a, in a sense you could say they were bought off but the argument that they were pushing to the fore was that we want land and um there was a sort of capture of a, of the ruling party <coughs> by a radical element of it led by veterans and to deny that that dynamic happened within zano pf i think is to miss the point and indeed the house of lords uh, report uh from uh is it last year i think uh, on, on, on whether there was indeed a, a deal uh, on land, uh, does observe that perhaps in hindsight, you know, uh, 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 the British government uh, did not pay due diligence to the, uh, 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 this <laughs> dynamic of the war of its actually capturing, you know, a, a, a policy within ZANU PF and pushing land reform to, you know, to the fore, and that they did not understand as a, as a consequence the kind of pressure that Mugabe and his government were under, you know, to institute land reforms. So. Of course, Zimbabweans are educated. Of course, there are people who want jobs and the like. But Zimbabwe is still predominantly rural. Let's not forget that. There are peasants who were pushed off you know, land and for whom land was still you know, a key issue you know, to be resolved. They waited upon that to be resolved. And um, so when ZANU-PF did finally you know, you know, uh, 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 respond to, you know, to, 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 to the land issue and also found convenience politically in doing so, they were also responding to a, to a key grievance there. So without taking away from the convenience, you know, politically, you know, of it. There was a real grievance to be resolved. Just, very, just, just very quickly. Can we just keep the land issue quite short and focus yes, on the elections, please? At Lancaster House, Lam the La uh, well, I was a young man and a clerk to the, some of the people who were there, so I was present, okay? The land question was on the table. The question is how was it dealt with? It's not it was absent. And what was pre how it was dealt with is that willing buyer, willing seller, close, in the Lancaster House Agreement. And within it was an agreement not to do anything, any amendment within the first 10 years of that, of that, of the Lancaster House Agreement. That's what happened. The, 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 the disquiet amongst people in Zimbabwe begins around 1982, around Shoshe, two years into that independence. So the land question has, is from the bottom up. It's not something Robert Mugabe dreams up, you know, finishing coffee or something. It has always been inside, inside, inside Zan politics, inside Zan politics, inside African politics in the region. Now, the, the, the problem arises, and it is to do with the way in which the inequalities that uh, are inherited from within the imperfections of the Lancaster House Agreement. On one argument, there's some people who thought that you could enshrine property ownership through leaseholds, da 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 and so on. And others were arguing that no, the state should be should remain custodian of the land and then it is distributed in alliance with the people equitably. Two political directions emerge. And that has dominated Zimbabwean politics ever since about the land question. Now, of course politicians from time to time will pick up the popular, you would, what else is politics about other than that question? But no one could possibly, in my view, 
get into political ascendancy in that country without coming with an overarching, <coughs> convincing narrative about the land question. That's why it is such a conflictual issue. Yes. Um, yes. My name is Amir Gori. I'm a journalist. Two brief questions. Uh, first is, you know, in European, how connected is the Zimbabwean uh, opposition with the people? Because we have seen in countries like Zimbabwe, you know, where people are sitting, leaders are sitting for 30 odd years. Uh, one, there is no opposition. Second, the opposition looks outward, you know, for support. The point you briefly mentioned towards America, towards Europe, you know, to support. And secondly, do you see any chances of seeing something uh, of the nature what uh, North Africa is, uh, you know, experiencing these days? Uh, for some reason, people come out in the street. Do you see that that can actually happen in, you know, uh, your part of the world? We live in hope. Um, not just in Zimbabwe, but there are, I think there are, there are worse countries um, where you would like to see something like that happen, particularly, say, Eritrea. Uh, but no, I, 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 I don't see that. Um, the support of opposition groups, remember, of course, the MDC has the largest numbers in parliament. <coughs> support, support of opposition has always come from outside. And so you must remember, during the war, ZANU was funded largely from Europe. It was armed by China. ZAPU was armed from the Soviet Union. But they did mix and move with the people. And this is, a, uh, in my research that I've been doing recently, um, to try and f update my, my book, What Happens After Mugabe. Uh, my publishers commissioned me to update, and I've been getting research done in the rural areas. The MDC really does have a problem in rural areas. It's not a problem of support. There's massive support. And if the MDC goes out and holds a rally in Marewa or Matoko, they will get thousands of people to come along. They'll have a bigger support than ZANU PF. But they will leave town. Here's a criticism straight from the rural areas, straight from the rural areas that we're talking about. They will leave town at 4 o'clock in the morning in their, in their cars so they can get to the rural area for 10, 11 o'clock, have their rally, retire to the local hotel for lunch, not have lunch with the people, and get back and sleep in their beds at night. ZANU is actually in the rural areas with their youth brigades, with their war veterans, with their CIO, oppressive, whatever you want to call it. The fact is they're there 24-7. And MDC does not like sleeping on cold floors and not having TV and not having cold beer and not having hot food. It's rough and tough. I grew up in the rural areas. It's rough and tough out there. And yeah, there is, there is a problem. I don't think, I still believe in a free and fair election, MDC would walk it. It's my view. But they could do a lot more to ingratiate themselves uh, with the, and, and be with the suffering of the rural people. There was some discussion in 2008 um, when there was talk of a unity government, it was finally formed in February 2009. Up until then, the MDC had a lot of structures in the rural areas and were quite effective in being there the whole time. And then those were kind of shut down because <coughs> there was now a unity government. It wasn't needed. That was a mistake. Well, when, well not necessarily. I mean, I, I, he, I read very recently on one of the MDC's websites publishing the numbers of rallies and meetings that they've had over the last 18 months in order to dispel the argument that they've become bankrupt. And they've published a list of meetings that they've held in, in throughout the country. And I think the argument one is making is that you have to have a, a long jury, a sustained presence in an area, which is not the same as being allowed to meet. Oh. Because if you say we're not allowed to meet, or Robert Mugabe will say, well, you met on A, B, C, D, E, you have this, this, and the other. What is missing is a sustained presence, whatever the difficulties yeah, in yeah. a long time, and secondly, having a convincing argument that people can live with. People are fed up, yes, and they want change, yes, but that does not necessarily translate into George Shiri, you know? It has to translate to how it responds to their question. And the challenge for the, for the opposition is precisely that, that it has failed to address things as they exist, not as they would like them to be. Um, Matt? Just before, I'm sorry, but it's, I think it's really important that we keep this contextualized. How hard it is for the opposition. I absolutely agree the MDC have missed a huge amount of tricks and are doing a lot that's wrong. But we did an interview with a guy about a year ago from the MDC. He was in a rural area. He was in an MDC building. And as we were speaking to him, the building was attacked. You could hear the glass smashing in the background and everything. And I will never forget what he said. We were interviewing him and he just stopped and he said, you know, I'm so tired. 
I'm so tired, I'm absolutely exhausted. He's just a guy working on the ground. His family's been beaten up, they're in a safe house, he doesn't know where they are. When he leaves there, he doesn't know where he's gonna sleep that night. He's been tortured three or four times. He's walking down the road, he's not gonna go and get into a bed, and he's not gonna go and get on a mobile and get a nice hot cup of tea and stuff. So, yes, there's some fat cats there enjoying the fruits of the earth and everything. There's a lot of guys on the ground for whom it is damned hard to maintain a presence in a rural area. Yeah, sorry, I wanted yeah, want to uh, respond to uh, um, his question, uh, specifically the one about North uh, African riots and the probability of that happening in, in, in um, perhaps maybe in other parts of Africa, including Zimbabwe. Um, I think I do share uh, Jeff's view that um, Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, has not does not have a precedent <laughs> of uh, mass protests, you know, leading to a, a, a regime change, and uh, in particular in Southern Africa. Southern Africa is uh, unique in Africa for being the hub of our national liberation movements, from Angola to Mozambique, South Africa, Zimbabwe. You know, these are countries that fought, you know, a protracted liberation struggle. South Africa had, had its own peculiar, you know, a uh, question, you know, through apartheid, but um, and um. All of these national liberation movements, uh, particularly those that waged, you know, armed struggles, have not uh, 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 vacated power. Um, Zambia, because Zambia's independence came through a different, you know, uh, sort of, you know, channel, and so there was a change from uh, the founding nationalists there. But you know, in, in, in all these other countries, Angola, uh, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, South Africa, the founding uh, liberation parties are still in power, and they are still pretty much in power. And um, I don't see uh, a, a, a mass uprisings in, 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 in those countries. With respect to Zimbabwe, there is one telling statistic that I wanted to bring to the fore. The 2008 elections are widely accepted as um, uh, the closest to uh, <laughs> free and fair elections that Zimbabwe has ever had uh, in a long time. Um, but um, in the parliamentary elections across the country, uh, while the MDC <coughs> won slightly more seats, parliamentary seats, than uh, 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 ZANU-PF, in terms of the popular vote, ZANU-PF pipped the MDC. So now when you look at the balance in terms of numbers and support, it is not a clear cut you know, issue that the majority is with the MDC. Indeed, if you go by those election results, there were more heads that voted for ZANU-PF than voted for, mm -hmm. for the MDC. Uh, so that's one thing when, to consider when, you, when you're considering the riots. And also uh, the margin of terror or violence, because this is a, a clear and present issue with respect to Zimbabwe. Uh, at the very inception of independence, Zimbabwe was plunged into violence uh, in the multivalent areas. More than 20,000 or so people would want to debate the figures, but at least thousands of Zimbabweans you know, are, were killed. And, um, I said, that violence still resonates, you know, to this day. Or you could tell, you could take the 2005 uh, Operation Muramba China. Uh, that's a massive deployment of state violence, and uh, there is no illusion on the part of Zimbabweans just what kind of response, you know, uh, 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 they can expect from, from 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 the government if they should, you know, engage in a mass uprising. And um, it remains to be seen if there should be some kind of catalyst that spurs, you know, Zimbabwe towards such spontaneous action, I wouldn't put my money on it. <laughs> can I, can just one more uh, point, Miles, but then can we try and bring this back to elections and how we see it panning out over the next 12 months or so? Yeah, uh, just a quick on, on the, the bit about um, uprisings coming, coming to spreading south to, to southern Africa. Uh, with regards to Zimbabwe, I think any other place, when you have such uprisings, it's about a moment. There's a particular moment you took advantage of it. You had Tunisia, the Egyptians took advantage of it. You had the now now you have this this the phenomenon in, in Libya, and Zimbabwe has had its moments, right? Where 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 an uprising could have been staged. 2008, for instance, um, Zanupi have lost that election. Mugabe lost, but the results were not released for a whole month. Mm -hmm. Did any MDC figure or anybody go into the calling people to go to the streets? No. Again, 2000 election was stolen in 2000, right. Um, what, did, what was the MDC's response? I'll read your quotation from my book. Um, this is an MDC official, um, David Coulter. I'm quoting him now. The international community pleaded with us to hold off on the use of civil disobedience and mass action, promising at the same time that if we backed off, they would do all they could to increase pressure on Mugabe. <laughs> there you go. Serious intellectual work requires us to address some difficult questions. Southern Africa did not 
have a version of the Enlightenment project like the North. It didn't. So you really need to think about the coinage, the uses, the concepts that you're deploying on, or the expectation of the arrival of the moment with that in mind. Now, Botswana is a very interesting place. Botswana has been ruled by the same outfit since independence. So if you're talking about representational um, in participative or representative, you have to ask those questions and you see how they play off on the arena. Um, uh, if you want to make a comparison, Northern Africa, North Africa or the Arab world or Latin America for that matter and Southern Africa. And the last moment I'll make, Nelson Mandela, not the person, the figure of Nelson Mandela still holds a currency in the region, not just in South Africa. Young people, you might want to comment on that, young people in South Africa will say to you, I'm waiting for the moment when Nelson Mandela will die. Now, he, he, he read that as a metaphor to suggest something is holding people off from, t from doing something that it would otherwise be. Right? So the future of Zimbabwe is interconnected with the future of the region, partly because of the history of the frontline states of Sadak and so on, but also what you see in the metropolitan centers that make up the region. These are the same people, same families. If you're in South Africa, you'll find a Nyoni. If you're in Mozambique, you'll find a Hungwe. If you are in Zimbabwe, in central Zimbabwe, you'll find a Shiri. They are the same people, same family, same DNA, across political parties. They do, tribes do not exist. That's an invention of something else. What you have in the region will tell you whether or not the repetition in North Africa or Southern Africa will take place. That's what serious concerns enables us to see. We can't really be talking seriously if we think it in terms of a calendar events. It could have happened in such and such. <laughs> that it's, it's a seductive, but the reality is quite different from, because the, the vocabularies, these institutions that grew out of the national liberation movements is quite different. Were it not the case, we would not be, I mean, Algeria went through national liberation movement. You might want to say, what is the trace of the French in the north, in as much as the trace of the Anglos in the south, is a kind of comparator. But the key point I want to make is that the Enlightenment project did not leave out, has yet to happen in the Southern African region in the way it has happened elsewhere. And sometimes it's important to pay attention to that in order to understand the place of these notions of democracies and so on as they play themselves out in Jombe of all places. We have a question from the audience, I believe. Yeah, uh, and then I'll come to you. Uh, Richard Hamilton, BBC. Um, you were saying that Zimbabwe is not all about Robert Mugabe, but he's such a huge figurehead and he sort of strides the country like a colossus that. I don't quite see how you can say that. And, and secondly, who, who are the likely successors? Do you ask me? No, I, no it's me because I, I made the point in my first comment. No, I, I didn't say it's not about Robert Mugabe. I said we need to see past Robert Mugabe. Robert Mugabe is a very old man. Uh, if he was in his 40s, I wouldn't be making that comment. In his 50s, he's a very old man. And I think we have to accept that there are a whole lot of problems that are going to stay even after Mugabe has left. One of them is 90% unemployment. One of them is mass diaspora, the brains of Zimbabwe, outside. And I hear people telling me again and again, when freedom comes to Zimbabwe, everybody's going to go home. I've been working in Central America. When Central America were, had all these repressive regimes in Panama, in Nicaragua, um, in El Salvador, people fled to the US. Panama is now booming. Nicaragua is doing very, very well. Have they gone back? No, they haven't. And so the dentist who's now set up, gone from Masringo and set up a practice in Manchester, 10 years ago, maybe she'd have gone back. Now her husband's got a job, her kids are at school there, people are not going to, we need to look at things like getting brains back into Zimbabwe. We need to look at things like mass unemployment, the collapse of infrastructure, the media, huge reform of the media. What I was saying is these are problems that we need to have a three, four, five year look at. Instead, it's all a case of, well, let's wait for Mugabe to go, and then just Mother Teresa is going to descend from heaven and kiss it all better. And of course, that's not going to happen. But just a quick well, comment on that one. You said um, just a, a connection between um, uh, 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 Jeff's observation and, and what Miles just uh, uh, noted in terms of uh, uh, his interview with Thabo Mbeki. Mugabe was about to step down in 2008, having lost the elections. But there was somebody else or some force that stayed, you know, his departure. I, I think that tells us, you know, uh, quite clearly where power lies in Zimbabwe. The, you know, I've often described Zimbabwe as BBC's favorite country. 
in, in. You know, I, I'm, and I'm really very serious about that because I think the BBC projects its own reading onto Zimbabwe, which is not what it is. And that's precisely what you end up being obsessed with, politely, with Robert Mugabe. And uh, Zion politics, believe you me, is not driven. Zimbabweans are not stupid to be driven by an 87 year old man. You know, the, I mean, it's really a caricature of Zimbabweans to suggest that we're incapable of seeing something different. It, it just is so ridiculous. That is not the point. Of course, he's an actor on the stage, but he's not the end and the beginning or whatever. Th that is a criticism I make of the BBC. You guys have interviewed me so many times. I've said agnosia. The reason, one of the, <laughs> the, 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 other, the other thing I want to say is that because you become so obsessed with Robin Mugabe, you fail to look at a number of other issues that would enable us even to give support properly if we wanted to, or to understand what it is that the rest of the G77 sees in Robin Mugabe that the rest of the world doesn't. You know, I don't buy this argument that Thetan leaders or people who have their own intelligence, their own intellectuals, who run around Southern Africa, are so dumb that they can't continue to support this person, and the BBC doesn't. I mean, please, it, they, they re we really need to pay attention to things as they exist. That's the first. The second complementary remark to that, it's not, it's not, a, and, it's, and it's to do with the, with, I mean, someone ought to write a book about journalism in the, in the age of neoliberalism, in the way in which the coinage of what constitutes governance now, good governance, is the place, the place we used to call civilization. You know, we, we talk about people in the third world as if they don't know their political landscape. They do. They face it daily. So the, it's the difficult, it's the, I know it's difficult, but I don't think it's held by simply being obsessed with Robert Mugabe because it, there is nothing to say about an 87 government. I mean, people would think he was 21. I mean, again, what happens after 34 years? It doesn't disappear. The question still remains, what sort of Zimbabwe, one that grew out of national liberation movements, or one that pays service to neoliberalism. Those are the stark choices. Yeah. I just, I, I, I think that the support of Robert Mugabe, such as it is, is the support of somebody who knows how to hold on to power. And I think here of someone like Ceausescu, those are old enough to remember 1989, Christmas Eve, and Ceausescu being overthrown by his people. And as he's about to be strung up, the British government revokes his knighthood. <laughs> and once he was dead, it was, the former dictator, Nikolai Ceausescu. When he was in power, it was our ally, Ceausescu. And in the latest revolts in Libya, Tony Blair has been oh so silent. <laughs> and you're hearing the British government saying, you know, the tyrants, um, in, tyrants who are ruling Libya. Now, actually, they've been there for the past 42 years. Hello? And it's the same, I remember, I was in Australia when Marcos was overthrown in the Philippines. Marcos was everybody's mate until he was overthrown, the former time. Mobutu Sesseseko. I think, George, the, the support such as this of Mugabe, you support the guy who is the smartest on the block. And whether you like Bob or not, he's really smart at staying in power. And you've got to do business with the guys at the top. That's just my view. There's a question here at the front, and then I'll come to you. Thank you, Mr. Blair. Thank you. <coughs> Hi, uh, Richard Turner. Um, a lot seems to be made of the fact that the, the strength of Zanu PF is due to the mediocrity of the MDC. Um, to what extent would you say that's due to the fact that, that no meaningful opposition has been allowed for so long and that the power sharing agreement has been something of a learning process? And so would you say that the MDC has learnt from this? Uh, do you think they'd be able to prevent a more, uh, present a more meaningful opposition going forward or do we need another faction to emerge to challenge the status quo? I suppose that will, <coughs> excuse me, I suppose that will be my question. Um, um, I wouldn't say that um, um, like Zanu's like ability to, to stay in power thus far is is all down to, 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 to the, the opposition's mediocrity, but I think it's, it's, it's a big part of it. There are a number of other things that, that come into play, but that's a big part of it. But I think the for me, I think the, the, the good Friedrich Nietzsche was so right um, all those years ago. He who fights with monsters should look to it that he himself does not become a monster. Mm -hmm. And when you gaze into the abyss, the abyss gazes into you. Mm -hmm. I'll give you another good example. I go back every two months or so now um, to Zimbabwe. I meet opposition figures. Um, these guys used to be super lean, lean as in hungry. Right? Every time I go back, 
they're putting on weight. <laughs> they're, 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 wearing, <laughs> they're wearing more shiny and expensive suits, right? Um, they own flashy businesses now. And I keep wondering, um, um, wh where is this money coming from? This has all happened in the power sharing phase, right? You speak of violence. Zanupiev is a violent party. Um, I, I don't dispute that at all. But look at the MBC 2005 split. It was over the internal uses of violence um, in the opposition. The That's internal right. commission of, of inquiry reports that show that Trangirai would use violence against internal rivals and continues to do today. So I think you have to think about um, um, a third party. I don't see um, the next leader of Zimbabwe coming out of the MDC, right? And I don't see the next leader of Zimbabwe coming out of Zanu Pierre either, right? So that's, uh, I think, I won't get into much detail, but 20, <laughs> 2011, um, there are going to be significant political shifts and new political formations that are going to surprise a lot of people. Can I just say something very quickly, a friend of mine phoned me from Zimbabwe <laughs> recently about an MDC you minister she just that. bumped into, and I, I won't name who it was, and she <laughs> said, Jerry, all I can say is he was wearing a pimp suit. <laughs> <laughs> Sadly, they are getting very shiny. We, the, the, we, we underestimate enormously the allure of power. Eh? We really do, at our expense. Now, I, I you know, <laughs> it, one of the saddest things about North Africa is also at the same time a counter-revolution in the making. When Cameron, our dear Prime Minister, has been accompanied by, you know, military men to sell arms, presumably. I mean, what, what are those guns? They're not going to shoot birds with them. You know, they're not, they, you know, they're the very, the very, the very, this is a sort of <laughs> neoliberalism with a harsh and newer face. You know, you know, the Mubarak power machine is still very much in, pers in place. We need, that's what I mean by distinguishing the person and the, 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 the rhizomatic nature of power, yes? And, the, and, and, and what I, all I see the MDC have been uh, done is to find itself in bed with the enemy. Or the, in bed with, what is the name of that film? It, it's, 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 it's been sleeping with the enemy. Now, you might like the enemy, you might dislike, dislike them, but people in Zimbabwe aren't going to vote for you simply because you sleep with the enemy. They might vote for you if you say something distinctly different that impacts on their day-to-day -day lives. And I'm sorry that is not what is emerging within the culture. There have been cultures of opposition in the region and they are, as I say, dominated by those two traditions. The question is, do they have convincing narratives that can make A shift into B? And the problem for the MPDC, with its friends right across the world, is to fail to understand the intricacies of what's going on on the ground. And that has become the MDC's albatross. It can't, it is quoted rightly or wrongly, and international brigades of friends. Now, all, every time anybody in Britain says, support the MDC, it adds a notch votes for the for for Zan PF, believe you me. Because all Robert Mugabe can say is, see, I told you so. And it doesn't help the Zimbabweans whatsoever, good faith, willing, wonderful people you are, to be seen dancing on the streets. You know, it it just plays into that psyche of an anti historical relationship or marriage of misalliance between the West and the East. I spent the last 35 years of my life living in this country. One of the reasons I entered into this debate has to do with the way in which Zimbabwe is understood in the West. Not in Zimbabwe. I want Zimbabwe to learn. You know, this is not what they say in Zimbabwe. I say in Zimbabwe, I used to shut up. What happens in Britain about Zimbabwe <laughs> is, is a country that really is beyond mystery recognition. It's not the country that I know of, or most people know of. It's one that can, it can only be understood by what I call fast food intellectualism in the metro as it were you know i mean you would really think you would really think this is a dire place well it is a dire place but not the one that you think with and part of that responsibility if we must is to reconfigure and see things as they are not as i would like them to be and in some way we might then be able to lend support should, should we do so there's a lady there with a question <coughs> Good evening, Anna Fuha from Eurasia Group. Um, just two very quick points. I think uh, I've certainly observed myself as well that the MDC ministers are increasingly losing their leanness. Uh, I think that's very true. And I've, in fact, I've heard from uh, South African bankers that are increasingly going in and doing deals in Zimbabwe that more and more they structure their deals, uh, like it or loathe it, um, they structure their deals so that there's some kind of cut for both MDC and ZANU figures. 
Um, so my question, and what I wonder to myself also is, you know, what will be the impact of uh, bringing in investment without really um, any meaningful political reforms taking place? That's my one question. And um, the second question that I feel we haven't really addressed at all yet is really the role of the secur securocrats, the role of the, the generals. Um, you know, what role are they playing? Are they ready to give up their vested interests? Because I, for one, I see them more and more pushing into commercial deals, and what will that mean for their political uh, attitudes going forward? Trafalgar, would you like to start um, taking that? <coughs> Yeah, um, on the uh, on the on the role of uh, uh, say say uh, business and uh, the unreformed or unrestructured you know a, a, a political you know situation, um, I'll give an anecdote. The uh, the Chinese uh, ten billion dollar investment um, uh, uh, into mining and agriculture. Um, the Chinese foreign minister uh, gave uh, 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 or released a statement uh, urging the West to lift sanctions on Zimbabwe, saying they harm the economy. Uh, just after meeting uh, Prime Minister Morgan Changirai, he met the, um, the President Mugabe, then he met Changirai, and uh, the person engineering, or at least at, you know, in the driving seat you know, over this $10 billion deal, is the economic you know, uh, uh, planning minister, who is a, a, an MDC guy. And clearly, you know, as the Guardian observed, some might, might have seen the article, um, both parties you know, in the inclusive government are at one you know, with respect to this deal. Uh, so which is why, you know, uh, from the outset when I made my opening remarks, I wanted to, uh, uh, s you know, to center on the role of uh, uh, business and the economy, you know, as, you know, playing a critical, you know, role in what happens this year. Because clearly there are some uh, uh, allegiances or at least some kind of understanding, you know, that cuts across the parties. So there's a way in which business is understood mutually by, by the parties in power. So whether there is an unreformed, you know, a, a state is one question, but that business is good and the going is good. That's a, uni a universally accepted, you know, you know, fact. Jeff, the generals. Yes, I, I do believe you. You have to look at what happened in Zimbabwe between 1983 and 1987. What some people call a genocide, what certainly is a mass murder, and you have to look at places like Guatemala, uh, Cambodia, where justice has come 30, 35 years later. The justice has come. I do believe there's a real fear on the part of people like Per and Sherry, and I believe, I haven't spoken to Per and Sherry, that uh, you give up power and you could suddenly be on trial. In Zimbabwe, in a, you could be answering for your crimes. You commit crimes against humanity. You could be answering for those crimes. And I do believe that there is a strong element within the military that would want to stay in power for that reason. I don't believe Thabo Mbeki when he says that, or well, maybe Mugabe was willing to step down, ZANU was not about surrendering power. They are not, any more than Gaddafi is about surrendering power. They are not about surrendering power. And this is the phenomenon of politics. You look how strong leaders like Margaret Thatcher had to be absolutely dragged out of 10 Downing Street by her own party. Strong leaders and strong parties do not give up power easily. Unfortunately, in Zimbabwe, the response is a violent one. Frequently, it has been a military one. In Murambatsvina, in payback, when people have voted the wrong way and um, support, support unit, police support unit, have gone into the high-density areas and beaten people up. The role of the military is very important. The fear of the military is hugely important, uh, both in town and in the rural areas. Zimbabweans traditionally have not voted for anything. They voted against things. I was in Zimbabwe in 1980, the 1980 election. People didn't vote for Mugabe. They voted to stop the war. They would vote for anybody. The people in the middle, the ordinary, what we call the povo, the ordinary civilians were the people who paid the price for that war and suffered, attacked by the Rhodesian army, attacked by the guerrillas. They suffered terribly during the war. People vote against something. And I believe that in 2008, they voted not so much for the MDC, but against a continuation of what they were suffering uh, under Zanu PF. For the next election, I'm not sure there's anything to vote against. The economy is doing quite well. Business deals are coming in. MDC is morphing into Zanu. The generals and the army are still in power. I think it's quite an open book. I wouldn't like to call it. But if you're, in a, if you're a rural peasant, 
It's still not that great. You, there's 80, 90 percent unemployment. There's there is, but I'm not sure against. that the MDC has actually put up. I, I do believe in a free and fair election. People would vote against ZANU because it's time for change. It's time. I mean, a free election, free media, not the Herald, not the ZBC becoming the, <coughs> the, the, the mouthpiece for ZANU, which it still is. In a truly free and fair election, I do believe people would vote for change. I'm not entirely convinced that vote for change means we think MDC is a great idea. I think it's, wow, well, we've had enough of this, let's try something else. I'm not convinced MDC has actually won, won the case. Miles, you wanted to say something? Hi, uh, <clears throat> I wanted the, the question about the, the generals and the military and to, and to quarrel with Jeff a little bit. I want to be honest with you. Um, um, if anyone tells you that they understand um, the generals or the military's mindset, they're lying to you. Exactly. No one has ever interviewed them. Solomon Muju, one on one at length, exactly. or any other yeah. military figure. And the gentleman here speaks about um, them being afraid of um, being prosecuted, right? And he refers to parents, sh uh, the parents Shiri. Yeah. Yeah. He cites his parents, Shiri. Who led the. His real name game. isn't parents, yeah, Shiri. Exactly. It's Perance. Mm -hmm. It's spelled P E R R A N C E. Mm -hmm. But everywhere you go, human rights documents, the, the Gukra Hund reports, it's spelled P E. It's not a Shiri either. And it's not a Shiri either. So it's that, those little things. If you can't get the guy's name right, you don't know what the mindset is. This is the name he uses. No, it's not the name he uses. He's not art, he's not. Go to Defense House, it's not the name he uses. So so that's what I'm going to get. Nobody really knows. It's And I have to say this, it's a black hole, a very, very black hole we know nothing about. Anyone who tells you they know anything about the army or army politics is lying to you. I don't have a straight answer. Nobody knows. I wanted to thank you very much for today. I, you know, I, I, I am Shiri, although my father put an E on it. And, and I have, you know, if you go to my name on the web page, you find loads of Zimbabwean websites, including British journalists who ought to know better, suggesting George Shiri is a relative of parents Shiri. It's, it's that kind of, it's that kind of ridiculous reproduction of ignorance that has come to dominate the political landscape. That's part of it. The second point is, is this. <laughs> If you all, if you, if you, it, it is important to, to get in today, do the hard work, and try and make sense of whether or not it is the case. And a lot, a lot of people are now saying Libya is different from Egypt because the, it hasn't got the military guys whom the Pentagon can phone. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Now, on, on the other hand, we say, well, maybe if we didn't have a military in Zimbabwe, it would become like what? Like Libya? Do you know what I mean? Things are not as, a, as a intransferable in that way. The, the, the question is, if you want to understand <laughs> what it is that continues to command support, limited, maximum as it might be, you have to go to the things that people say are determining their political day to day and actually listen to them, not caricature them. What the Malcolm's know one of the best ways of getting, getting out foreign currency is to speak to a foreign journalist. You know, and you have to somehow think about think about the difficulty about that. They, you know, these are smart people. They're not stupid. They know how to play the game. They know the difference between their heads and their stomachs. But you, you know, in, and that's some of what makes the work very difficult. So, in thinking about the so-called stranglehold on the military on Robert Mugabe, it, it, it uh, actually it is the the other way around. If you want to understand some politics. You really have to go a lot, take a longer leaf. You have to go back to the 60s and figure out how the index of violence is connected to all political institutions in that country. That is if that's what you're trying to understand. If you're trying, it has something to do with why in those kind of post-colonial sites, be it Jamaica, South Africa, Nigeria, or some Kenya, at every electoral point, things get into a frenzy. Does it tell us something about the limitation of political moment, political electoral politics as a limitation? I don't know, but we can't continue to address that question in that narrow sense because it continues to come back and it continues to haunt us all the time. My contention is there are no Mother Teresa people in Zimbabwean politics at all, left, right, and center. They're all in it. And okay. uh, can I just say something on the military? I mean, no, in my own view, I think, frankly speaking, the Zimbabwean state is a military state in disguise. Zimbabwe belongs to the military. And um, if you go back into the history of the liberation movement, Zanla, the liberation you know, armies, co-opted the politicians and not the other way around. 
And uh, it has been like that ever since. The succession debate within ZANU or, or, or the search for a successor to Robert Mugabe is not a succession process that is limited to the political party. The army or the military will find a successor to Robert Mugabe. Uh, that's my honest view. Yeah, yeah. And I, 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 I don't know if any, I, I'm yet to be convinced by any other argument. No, I can tell where it's come from. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you very easily where that is going to come from. In fact, you don't have to restrict yourself to Zimbabwe. All I say, if you look at all the political institutions that grew out of the liberation wars, be it in Zimbabwe or out of Zimbabwe, they all, at their core, the core leadership is a mixture of that spirit, that version of it. So it's a necessary projection of it. All those institutions have yet to rethink themselves in light of the future. Yeah? There are discussions inside Zanpev sometimes and sometimes not, but they, they are inevitable. But they are not going to be fixed by a calendar of a constitution or a declaration that there's going to be Robert Mugabe is going to not step down or whatever, or this kind of paper exercise. There's a whole cultural turnaround that is to happen in all those institutions. And they are not confined as well. Way. They happen to be occupy what I would call the hegemonic ground. And because they occupy the hegemonic ground, they determine the nature and pace of political language and development and so on. Now, you don't have to like it, but that's what it is. And by Can the I way, the, the generals are going to school. <laughs> <laughs> they, are, they are all students in the political studies department, the university. They are taking courses in political science, international relations, and public policy. They are preparing for life after the camouflage. Mm -hmm. I'll get back to that. I just want to point out something which I think shouldn't just go by it, that uh, you said, George, reproduction of ignorance. May I just clarify that mistakes made by journalists on Zimbabwe is because ZANU-PF won't speak to us won't answer questions, won't clarify things. It's very, very hard to get yeah. correct and accurate I'm sorry. information. I'm sorry, that's not true. Actually, it's it true. is Wait, true. Nobody, no, look, it's it's true. in your radio station, Lance Guma has refused to clarify why he keeps telling people that I am Lance, I'm Perrin Sishiri's brother. I am in your face sitting next to you. I'm not in Zimbabwe. I'm at the end of the phone. It has impacted on my family. I've had to seek recourse protection from the police. My father's grave been doped with paint because of that assertion made by a radio station. Not Zimbabwe, right in the West. Maybe made by Mr. Guma. I can't answer that. It's not made by the radio station. And I just must point out that we have never been able to interview anybody from Zanu PF in 10 years. If anybody has ever answered the phone, they have just raged at us. I've been a journalist in Zimbabwe for 25 years. I was fired from the state media for opening the phone lines during the first food riots and allowing people to speak freely. It is very difficult to get accurate information and mistakes get made The point made I'm making with, with respect, if it can happen to me on my front door, what basis do I have to believe otherwise to something that happens 2,000 miles away where either you or me are there? Can, I just, can I just add to this, me? George? This is a very African phenomenon, what? which I deal with all the time. I cover 13, 14 countries in Africa. And you will run a story on, say, Tanzania, and the opposition will talk to you. You try and get hold of the minister, <coughs> and, of course, nobody wants to talk to you. And the next day, the minister's office phones your editor and says, this is a biased story. You didn't give our point of view. Uh, but it's very, very difficult to get things verified. It really is right up and down Africa. People are scared to talk in case and they I, get bounced I, I don't think it's, um, it's limited to uh, shortwave radio Africa as well. Just speaking from my own experience in Zimbabwean journalism and even what goes on to this day, um, Zimbabwean journalists don't have access to uh, the military. There's never, I'm um, yet to see an interview where either the Zimbabwean Independent or whichever newspaper, you know, sits down with the general. <laughs> oh, the herald it, itself. Uh, uh, yeah, or the herald itself. <laughs> oh, so in any in interview with all these big wigs, especially in the state media, they are all arranged. You know, it's not a spontaneous, you know, initiative by a journalist or an editor in the newsroom mm -hmm. saying, I want to speak to the general and ask exactly how the dynamics within ZANU-PF played out. It, it, it just doesn't happen. They are beyond access. And it seems that's the way it is. We've just got five minutes, so I just very quickly <laughs> want to bring up a very dodgy topic here, and that's diamonds. Mm. This is going to impact so strongly on the elections, diamonds on the military, and that's why the military is not going to let go. The largest alluvial diamond fields in the world have sadly been found in Zimbabwe. Jeff, start with you. I've been researching this topic um, for the last few months, and I have talked to I don't know how many 
people who have been handcuffed and set upon by dogs, people who have been beaten, bludgeoned. What is going on in Morangi is a crime against humanity. And I tell you that as someone who has spoken and seen the scars, and uh, it is just terrible. But the economic side of that means that the Zimbabwe government, and I, by that I mean the MDC, the military, ZANU, the players in the game will very soon have the power to buy just about anybody. And that is very scary, because that's what we see in places like Saudi Arabia. Saudi's not going to change because Saudi can just buy anybody. Buy off leaders of riots, buy off foreign governments, buy off anyone. And that really worries me in Zimbabwe that that is what we're going to see there in the future. I have no answer to it. I just say, heaven help us. I go back to that page, that verse or paragraph in the Freedom Charter, the ANC's Freedom Charter. And by the way, all national liberation movements in the region have their kind of tributary. They were born out of that 100 years ago. But I go to that moment in the Freedom Charter that talks about the nationalization of the mines and the nationalization of national assets and reinventing with a Marxist bent, I would say, reinventing the state with a distributive instinct with an alliance of the people. Eh? And if I, that is what I would like to see happen to the to the diamonds. And I'd say what I would like to see, because that for me is a kind of political argument to be made and to be heard. And I don't think, and I don't think any, I don't think, I don't, part of that is sometimes called indigenization or empowerment, but that's just tinkering on the edges. <coughs> I do want to see a real distributive instinct with alliance of the people so that the benefits of whatever the mines or the fresh water or the land is really shared by um, uh, people in the country. I call that the extension of the unfinished business of the liberation war. So it's not a sort of event or already, already existed. It's something, it's an argument that is yet to be made and I look forward to having that argument. We're just running out of time and I have a quick question here, I believe. Well, the key is, I mean, you are very intelligent. I mean, I haven't got good knowledge of uh, Dr. Mugabe and that state. Sorry, I forgot, sorry. One was Bashir. Uh, I run an organization called Connection for Development, which, we, which work on, on international level, uh, reducing poverty and supporting the MD, the eight objective of the uh, eight G uh, grouping of the eight uh, development goals. What we see in Africa, and I can see what you are saying today, it just matches up what goes on in even Pakistan. Three players, the generals, the army, which is head and face. You can't interview them on a political issues. They stay out of it. They got ZNP and MDC, and they'll be using them really from the back, <coughs> pulling those strings. Right. Now, what I'm looking from what you just said there, uh, that uh, ch uh, the with the next uh, um, next election, there's going to be these three parties can buy anybody because the other people like China coming along <coughs> and investing it, mm. investing in Africa and uh, Zambia. Uh, Zimbabwe. Oh. Now, Western powers, unfortunately. They put sanctions on these countries, which again hurt the poor people, the rural people, the rural people, not the ruling class really. That's where I think we are losing touch with that part of the uh, countries. And those three big powers, the third party, you say MDC and NUP, who else is going to come along? Unfortunately, people only know the two big players. One goes, the next one comes. They go, then the, again, the back one comes again. Now, this is the gap really. Those two parties got to work together for the, for the benefit of the people of the country. Really. If the opposition and the ruling party can work, then I think it may change some situation. Really. Thank you very much. And I think with that, we have to come to an end. I'd like to thank the panel. I think we're running out of time. Do we have time for another question? There's two questions. OK, there's a gentleman here who's got the microphone, and then a lady at the back. My Please question, go ahead. Uh, uh, my name is Javed Raja from Peace International. My question is very simple, you see, that uh, we did have uh, really intellectual talks and the seminars and the things. My simple question is how we can build up pressure on this those is avenues. Just not brandy. Sorry. On <laughs> those avenues where we can get the church. How we can do what? Get how we can get the pressure, to build up the pressure, to get the change. What is the solution for it? Very simple. Have a free and fair election. Simple. Universal. 
have a free and fair election. You know, I, I, I don't want us to develop a fetish around the word change, you know. It means all kinds of weird things. I mean, I no longer know what it means, actually. Um, um, you might find that strange. And I don't mean that I'm just interested in the same. I'm just, it, it has a peculiar currency. It's become a fashionable thing to say. I, and I say that more so in, events, in relation to events that are, are evolving in North Africa. Yeah? That's a, a counter-revolution in the making, if there ever was one. Yeah? And the idea that Cameron could literally walk in the Freedom Square and become a champion of a kind of new dawn from the bottom up, when hospitals are crashing down in this country, terrifies me. You know, I mean, you know, it, it's just we need to think things as they exist in that sense. And I, so the, the metaphor changes become, I need to put a squeeze on it somewhat. And I just want to, I just want to say one, 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 one little thing. Perhaps I, I didn't emphasize this enough. Zimbabwe must be thought as part of the region. It, its economic survival is interdependent on the other 13 countries that make up that region. Zimbabwe's survival is not in isolation everywhere else. That's probably why you hear them speaking as it were in the same voice. Those guys know so. Okay. W and 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 I think one of the interesting things that make uh, maybe an outcome of directly or indirectly of this GPA is the end of what I call um, uh, currency nationalism. You know, the RAND, da, 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 perhaps force the discussion of a possibility of a common currency in the region, whatever the reasons might be. So where you begin to see the strengths of each region, of each country interconnecting with the rest of the region. Seems to me that is a longer leash, thinking longer term. And within that, people will come and go. But those peculiar traditions that I tried to map up at the beginning are very much going to be the radar in which we make sense of what is going on. Thank you. And can we have the last mm. question from the lady in the back? Hi, my name's Camilla. I just wondered what the role you saw of the international community is for the future of Zimbabwe and what the West should be doing to help. Miles? <coughs> um, to be to put put simply, um, the the West should stay out. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, don't say anything at all. Don't um, Go. um <laughs> at all. And, and I'll give you one quick good example <laughs> from the 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 Becky interview as well. Um, Tony Blair wanted to stage um, along with the United States and Canada a military intervention in Zimbabwe, 2000. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pressured Tabo Mbeki consistently, but, and, and they refused that. They blocked along with the SADC leaders. So the West is not wanted in Southern Africa when it comes to, to Zimbabwe. Um, Business-wise, though, that's, that, that's problematic, too, because they're highly suspicious of. I'll give you an example. Saviour Kusukwere, the, uh, the indigenization minister, has sent, said countless times <laughs> that um, they'll look uh, up, upon British investment very suspiciously. They'd rather do deals with, uh, with the Chinese. Yeah. And so it's it's quite um and in some businesses as well um the on, on the sanctions issue um uh business people in zimbabwe uh to whom uh bp shell offloaded their interest in zimbabwe are coming out in support of the uh, the, 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 the you know the position against sanctions and um really wikileaks i think um has uh, really put mdc on the spot or mdc put itself you know on the spot and wikileaks has exposed that um, and, 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 and MDC has not been able to help its, you know, I, I, itself through some of the uh, engagements it has had with Western governments. Um, for instance, one of the key resolutions in the power sharing agreement is that they both campaign to lift sanctions. Now, MDC has said we don't have responsibility for campaigning for the you know, lifting of sanctions because we are not responsible for imposing them. We don't have an influence over the foreign policies of Western governments. And WikiLeaks provides, you know, evidence of uh, the finance minister, an MDC guy, uh, recommending to the EU which names to include on the sanctions list and which ones to take off, which state companies to remove from the sanctions. And the EU obliges. So now, all of that now is ammunition to ZANU-PF, and it goes into the long-running narrative that the MDC is a stooge. And indeed, the American cables have, 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 have not, you know, helped the MDC in uh, uh, quashing that allegation. I think it's really Richard Thabo and Becky, though, saying the West should stay out. When he was right in the center of the anti-apartheid movement here, and he was castigating Margaret Thatcher for not imposing sanctions on South Africa and Ronald Reagan. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's get things this clear. 
you know, I don't care. We're, I'm a citizen of the planet. I don't care where business operates, but I do want it. It's a poison as if it is, it, there is no regulative to it. And that what's going on is what regulate, regulative aspect you put on the international markets if they choose to work wherever in the place. You know, and that is the argument. It's not, uh, it's not whether or not it's the Chinese. And the question, the question there, in some, some attempts, some people think if you indigenize that kind of nationalism and deal with it, well, for the time being, in the longer term, you might have to rethink it. And that's why I argue that in the post-colonial moment, it's the regional institutions that matter. Because De Beers in Cape Town is the same as in Lusaka. You have to think of it in this kind of global, regional place. And then, at the same time, think about how to make sure it isn't poisonous to people. And that is the issue. That's one thing. The other aspects of the so-called, I want to, you know, people in the West should exercise a moratorium on thinking their bright ideas. You know, we, we really want to just forget it for the time being and perhaps learn from somewhere else. Why I say that? Because everything about the neoliberal story is collapsing. After all, think of the banks here. You know, you, the taxpayer, have become the guarantors of the nightmare, OK? And the idea that somehow it will just somehow tidy itself up next week, is, it does not appear on the landscape, you know? And so the idea that that stuff that has failed here is going to work out in India is absurd. Think of the IMF. And I know guys who work in the IMF. They, to get a job there, you need at least two PhDs to your name. It's hard enough to get one. And I'm still waiting for at least two, just two IMF policies that have worked. I thought you had two PhDs. No, I just, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just working, I'm just working for two policies that have worked. You, you know, I mean, that, 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 that we, we need, we are at that stage in our modern world in which we need to rethink the frontiers of, of politics for us all. The, we need to rethink Jay, the interconnection between the South yeah. and the North as, an, as incomplete projects. So if, if, if people who, have, who read business manuals are talking about the stuff I'm talking about, please come to dinner with me. The trouble is, I don't think they're interested in that at all. Thank you. And I'd like to bring this discussion to an end with a quick point about the business and the Chinese. It is tricky doing business in Zimbabwe when the government makes a statement recently saying we're going to nationalize the foreign mines, but not the Chinese ones. Uh, that is tricky. Did you want to say something? No, I didn't. I just want to thank you for having me. Thank you for the panel for coming here. I hope you've learned something. I hope you found it interesting. And I would just remind you, there will be an election at some time soonish in Zimbabwe. Who knows? Because the government doesn't really speak to us. And I wish you would remember the people living in the rural areas who have nothing, who are hardworking, who are poor, who are miserable, who are sad, who do not get the chance to listen to intellectual debates on it. And they just want a simple, <coughs> easy life. And they just want the politicians to stop playing games with their yeah, lives. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.